I've been waiting ages to make this video. It's the null binding and if you want to know how to do the needle I'll leave a link to the video where I made the needles that I'm using in today's video. Pleased to say it came out well. Thank you. Well at long last I'm here to do my null bending video and I must confess I'm a little bit daunted by it because I'm not super experienced but I do know what I'm doing and I kept thinking there were so many more people out there with more experience which have videos out what can I offer that's different and what I think it is is that for one thing I'm left-handed so the main video will be of somebody doing a project left-handed and I don't see any of them out there and the other thing is, I think I'm good at explaining things. So I'm hoping that I can do my best to address both of those things. And I'll put a link to the site that I think is the absolute best one. And it's a site called Nila Kintat. And the lady is so experienced and she explains all the stitches in both English and I think Finnish. So to start off with what null binding actually is, it just means needle binding. And although people quite often think when they see my pouch, they think originally it's crochet and then they go, oh no, it's not, is it knitting? And then I have to explain that it's neither of them. And I've started my new pouch already. I wear this virtually every day if I'm going out. I'm making a new one because I need it bigger and I just fancy a change of colour and it's ages since I did any nail binding and I want to do a pouch and also a neck collar for the winter. I'm going to just show you in very basically what nail binding is first because when you're learning an, a craft most people have heard of knitting they know what it looks like and you know that it's looping the loops through the previous row and that if you pull on it the loops will undo. With null binding, there's no loops to undo because you're not pulling loops through. The whole thing is coming through each piece every time. So I could cut this up and nothing's going to fray. Nothing's going to pull apart because they're more like knots than loops. So if I go to wrap the, wrap the yarn like that around my hand and then if I take them off and lay them down in a line you can see that there are lots of loops going around and around. Now if you imagine that instead of each loop being a separate loop, those loops were all intertwined with each other, then that basically is what null binding is. Each loop is intertwined around the loops before. And so if I look at this loop particularly, this loop could be intertwining amongst the previous two like that or it could go through the previous three or however many and the more it goes through the tighter a weave that you're going to get with your finished piece of fabric so I can show you on here we can see where I've stopped here there are the loops so this is my late this is my working yarn this is my previous loop and the one before and the one before and if I use this spare needle to follow the yarn back this working yarn is going through these through the back it's coming up round here through there and then there it goes it's weaving through weaving through coming out and back again and so you get this woven middle and dependent on how many loops and how many loops are woven through depends on what sort of fabric you get in the end so this one I'm doing here which is finish two by two is quite a firm it's not very stretchy and the stitches are mostly called after the places where examples were first found in archaeology so York stitch is named after a sock that was found in Coppergate York 
and Finnish stitch is from Finland. There's Oslo stitch and there are many more stitches than names, I think. But basically, if you see a stitch that has a place name, it's nearly always where the very first example was, was found and identified. I'll show you how I'm making my pouch and I'm going to really try and show you a right-handed version even though I've never done uh, nail binding right-handed I think I'm going to be able to show you as for needles I made these ones myself out of just a piece of wood and it's not very hard to make them you make them with a big eye but you can also use a normal needle and so I've got these two here just to show you what you could use and what wouldn't be good. So both of those have a really good big eye, which you need if you're going to use thick wool like I am. This one would not be very good because it's got a point at the end. So that one is not for using. This one, which is just a darning needle with a big eye, that's perfectly fine to be using. And the other type of thing where I don't have one is you sometimes find those long plastic children's embroidery needles for doing big wool embroidery. They would be perfect because they have a big eye and they're quite long. And my, my wooden ones are actually quite short. Uh, you'll see other people using needles that are really long. And so I'm going to show you the right-handed version with the starning needle just to show that it works just as well. And I'll show you my left-handed one with my spare needle. I'm using 100% wool and it's a single ply. And that's just because I like working with that. But also, these type of wools are perfect because you can felt the ends together. The main difference for nail binding than knitting and crochet is you're not working off the ball. So I shall just pull this apart. I'm going to pull apart about, about a yard. You'll find out that once you get going you definitely don't want to be working with something this short. But for starting off it's going to be fine. And I'm just going to thread my needle for the right handed version. I hope I can do it. So I'll do my left handed one first and then I'll attempt to do the pink one for right handed. So the main start is the way I learned on Nula Kintat was to make loops around my fingers. I'm going to just hold my tail and go once, twice, three times around my fingers. I'm going to hold them there and I'm going to pull my needle up through all those loops twist it and come back again and what I've actually got is a figure of eight on my needle and if I just hold that and pull through that's my first stitch being made and the working yarn is going to go over my thumb like that so I can let go now and that's on my thumb your thumb is the gauge you don't have, an, well, you, some people do do it what's called off the thumb, but I have not done that. All I ever do is on the thumb. So your thumb is the gauge of the size of your loop. And so you can see if you were going to make a pair of socks and somebody had a big thumb, they definitely use less stitches than if you were um, somebody with a tiny thumb. If you made the same stitches, you'd be making a smaller sock or a smaller mitten, or it might not fit you. So the working yarn always comes over your thumb, like that. And your newest stitch is always at the bottom of your thumb. And so the easiest stitch to do is called Oslo stitch. And you work with a stitch behind your thumb and a stitch on your thumb. And so that's called one plus one. So one stitch behind, one stitch on. So I am going to just, because the, the stitches are, it's just my starting little bit, I'm going to take just the nearest one and I'm going to go through that stitch like that and turn my needle and I come under the stitch on my thumb and under my working yarn. And then I just pull that through. And the easiest way is to hold on 
just here, pinch it just there and pull the yarn through. And you make sure that this stitch that you're making now tightens around your thumb, stays to the bottom. And your old stitch is now being made and goes off your thumb. And you've still got one stitch on your thumb. So I'll do that again. I'm going to take the stitch behind my thumb, twist my needle and go under the thumb loop and under the working yarn and pull it through again. Pinch it and pull it. And there's my next stitch that goes off my thumb. And I can go on like this. It looks a bit of a tangle at first, but I'm going to do a few and then you'll be able to see. So the more, the more you get away from your starting little tangle of stitches, the more you'll see what's happening. Put my thumb like that. So you can see the stitch behind my thumb. I pick that up, turn my needle and go under the stitch on my thumb under the working yarn. Just pinch it to hold on to it so you can pull it through nicely and make sure that your new stitch is always going to the bottom and that goes off your thumb. You can pull the chain a bit and I'll just make a few more at the normal sort of a speed. Now as you get faster you don't necessarily put that stitch off your thumb in the same manner that I'm doing there. You you can just you just pick it up. And as you're pulling through, you pull your thumb out so that the stitch tightens. And then your thumb comes out and it tightens on. But when you're starting, there's nothing wrong with pulling your new stitch straight up and taking that loop off. And if I can show you now, I'm just take my thumb out, nothing's going to unravel. They can take that out, that's just your starting loops. But can you see how the stitch is woven together? So here's my working yarn. There's the loop I've just made and it's going through and weaving under and over and by that way it makes your starting chain. So I make a few of them and show you how so when you're coming back on if you've put it down and you're coming back you know that you had one thumb loop so all you need to do even if that's pulled tight you just need to pull that out so that you can get your thumb back in and pull it snugly and then you're ready to go again. I put it back on my thumb and you keep going until you've got a chain long enough for what you need and I think I'll stop there for the moment and I'm going to try my best to do that right handed. Actually I've never done this so, so I'm going to make my starting loops like that. Pinch them and take my needle and I'm this time I'm using the darning needle. So I'm going to come up from the bottom, twist it round and come up through. And I have like a figure of eight on my needle. And I'm just going to pinch that a bit in the middle so I can pull that yarn through and get my first loop on my thumb. Like that. And you're always just pulling that snugly. Because that is your gauge. And if you're too tight or too loose, you'll have wobbly tension. But just you'll get used to the sort of tension you need to pull. So this is just my little starting piece. So I can just choose whichever loop here is okay to use. And I'm doing the Oslo stitch, which is one by one. So I'm going to go through that loop, which is the first one I can find behind my thumb. Go through that loop, twist it around and go under my thumb loop and under my working yarn. And pull the whole thing 
through. You can see why you can't work off the ball. You can't be putting your ball through, your ball of wool through your thumb every time. And as soon as you've tightened that one, it always has to go to the bottom, and that loop, that you, the old loop, goes off your thumb. That now becomes the behind thumb loop. So I'm going to pick it up, twist my needle, and go underneath there again. And I'll just put there my finger there so I can pull the yarn through. The yarn then tightens up on my thumb and I slip the old stitch off. I'll do that again through the one loop behind, twist under my thumb loop. And when I very first started, I didn't really understand the notation of how they set the stitches. It was just like one plus one, one two plus one, three. And then all of a sudden I just got it. So I think it's quite useful to learn that as you start. Because then when you look at any of the notation, you can get a sense of what you're supposed to be doing. So this Oslo stitch is... You would see it written down as one plus one, and the one, the first number one is the thumb loop one, and the second number one is the behind thumb. So it's on your thumb or behind your thumb. So if it was two plus one, I'd need to keep two loops on my thumb, and I could still pick up one behind. And you'll see when I go onto my bag that I'm doing something that's not this stitch. But again, I'm going to take the old thumb, or the old loop off, which now becomes the behind the thumb. My working yarn's here. I go, pick up one, twist through my thumb loop, pull the yarn through, tighten it up. The old stitches off my thumb. This does feel a bit, it's more awkward. It's not so awkward for my left hand, it's my right hand that's being awkward at the minute. So, I can, you can see when I put my hand round, how the working chain, the chain that you're making, is going along the back of my thumb. And there you can see, there's my current loop, the first old loop, the second old loop, the third old loop. And they're all just lining up. In a line just like you would see your crochet loops or your knitting loops so if I pull that off that's what the right-handed version looks like and you can see how the in fact that one's really obvious I pick mine you can see how there's this loop is coming under that one and under that one and it's coming round behind my working yarn and then over that one and over that one, under, under, over, and you can see them all looping back, but they're getting woven at the same time. So at some point, you need to either change direction, you can't keep going in one direction all the time, so you need to change direction, or join a circle, or some other thing. On this one, on these bags, I've done a long line, and then just turned direction and then started going in a spiral to make the bag and null binding definitely lends itself to spirals to flat circles to um, mittens where you're working round and round in socks but you can make flat flat work too so i'm going to change direction here so i'm going to put my loop back on my thumb and to change direction, instead of going here and picking up the old loop, I'm going to go here. And pick up a connecting loop first. So just like your knitting or your crochet, you have to join to the row below. I have to do that with the null banding too. And so I'm going to pick up this loop here which is on my chain and then I'm going to go to the behind loop which is there and then I'm going to do the thumb loop and the under the and still take that one off my thumb and so now I've changed direction 
And so this is another part of the notation. This would count as F1, front one stitch. Here are the loops of all the stitches lying, just like you would see a knitted stitch or a crochet stitch. And so the F1 means I'm going to join with one stitch from the front. And so I've been in that one. I'm going to come to this one. So I'm going to pick up the one stitch from the front. And then I'm going to go to the behind the thumb loop. And then through my thumb and the working yarn. And then the old loop goes off. I'll do that again. I've used that loop already. So I'm going to come to the next loop that I haven't used. Go through that one. Pick up my behind the thumb loop. Twist and come through the thumb loop. So that that is one, one, plus one, and front one. And that's how it would look if you were looking at the notation. Again, there's the one I've just used. I'm going to come forward. So front one. Behind the thumb one. Twist through my thumb loop and under the working yarn. So I'll just take that off my take that one off my thumb. That's my working loop. But you can see I've turned the corner. It's a bit sloppy actually. But It'll all tighten up eventually and I'm coming back along. So the reason that you're using these types of yarn is because you're only working with lengths of maybe a metre or if you once you get that you really know what you're doing and you want to use longer yarns you can pile the yarn up and I'll show you that when I'm working on my bag. But we're just felting them together and it's just a spit splice like people would do for knitting or anything else. I'm just going to, you could use water but people tend to not do. I'm just going to do that and felt them together. And if you're working in an acrylic yarn or something that won't felt you could definitely use a Russian join or anything like that but because these are wool I'm just going to felt them together like that. And this is one of the main things about null binding is you can't work off the ball. You have to work with separate lengths because every time your whole piece of yarn is having to come through every stitch. So I've joined my yarn. I'll get my thumb loop. There's my working yarn. I'll put my thumb back in the loop and I'm ready to carry on. So I've used that stitch. I'm going to go to the next one. That's F1, front one. Go to behind my thumb and pick up the last stitch I used. The one that's just gone off my thumb. That's the one that I'm picking up. Twist and under my thumb loop and under my working yarn. And you can see my finger just pinches in there so it can keep everything just perfect. And here's my new loop tightening the old one goes off pick up the new stitch pick up the one that's just gone off my thumb through under the thumb loop under the working yarn pinch it there and pull the whole thing through tighten that up on your thumb the old loop goes off and this is I think this is about the simplest stitch you can do but there are so many stitches and there you can see what the two rows look like. You get this nice little woven piece coming along here. I tried that on right handed. I did a few more stitches and I'm ready to turn the turn to do the next row. This is right handed. So I'm going to just skip the first couple of them. And I'm going to go into this one here. So there's all my loops going back the other way. Okay, through the front to connect it. I'll go that one. Through the front loop to connect it through my previous loop. Twist round and under my thumb loop. Put it back on my thumb. And under my working yarn. I'm going to pull through. So I've already used that one. 
come to this one. It's all front loop, behind the thumb twist, under the thumb loop and under the working yarn. And this makes it look really slow. But if you think when you first start knitting or crochet, you're really slow. And this is so different from learning knitting and crochet. So I've done another stitch, so I'm going to jump forward. I've used that, I've used that, I'm connecting onto this one. I'll pick that one up, go through behind the thumb, twist through the thumb loop, under the working yarn, pull, and then the old loop goes off. And in this way, I can work a flat piece of work by just changing direction at the end. Making sure the new loop is at the bottom so the old loop can slip off. And if I show you, if I drop my needle and show you how that's looking. It's, it's not very even because I'm trying to do it right handed. So even though I've shown you how to work flat, a lot of null bending is so easy to work in a spiral, but then you would need a circular start. And I think I'll keep that to another another time and plus there are videos out there that show you a circular start so I'm going to come back to my pouch and so I'm not doing Oslo stitch I'm actually doing finish two by two and so that's what I'm going to show you now and the other thing is I don't want to just work with a short length of about a meter I've got about two and a half meters here it just gets halved and halved until you've got a quite a bit of a working bit and then the rest is just doubled up all the time and I'm going to put the doubled ends through the big hole on my needle because as long as I can pull them through my thumb loops I can work with it like that and that's a way of having a lot of yarn a lot of yardage and still be able to work through your thumb loop I've just changed colours as well because I'm doing stripes and obviously and I'm working in a spiral so I don't have to go back and forward I've started off with I think I started off with 26 stitches and I worked along just exactly like that and then I turned in exactly the same way but once I'd worked along to this end I just kept going and I didn't make any increases and of course then it just means I'm working in a spiral. But the stitch I'm doing is 2 by 2 F2. So I'm going to, going to put my working yarn over my thumb. I'm going to put two loops on my thumb. Making sure that the latest one is at the bottom. And now I'm going to pick up two loops from the row below. You can see this is a lot tighter. So there's my working, there's my last loop that I used. I've got one new loop, one loop I've already used, two loops behind my thumb, so that's the last, the latest one and the one before. Twist and go through two loops on my thumb and under the working yarn. And I pull all of that through. Here it comes, there it is, there's my new loop coming down at the bottom of my thumb. Old loop goes off, leaving me with two loops on my thumb. And again, I'm picking up one new loop, but I'm going through the loop I've already used as well. And this is making a firmer weave. I'm picking up the last one I've just put off my thumb and the one before that which is there, twisted my needle to come through the two loops on my thumb and under the working yarn. Pinch it and pull. Old loop goes off the thumb. One new loop, one old loop, two loops behind, two loops on the thumb. So written down that would look like 2 plus 2 F2 for front 2. You can see them if I turn round you can see 
there's the one that's just gone off and then the previous one and the previous one and the previous one going back so you can see which ones you have to pick up I could pick up three behind my thumb which would be that or two or just one like the Oslo stitch and in this way I'm going to carry on working my bag a little pouch until I get ready to do the the little flap that I want to come over if I stretch it out you can see how tight how tightly woven that is I've carried on working my bag in the spirals until I got it to the size that would fit my phone in and my wallet and now I want to flap and so what I started to do was I got to the back of there and then decided I would go back and forwards and so I've just been changing direction and you can see it there how it's changed direction and I've done a couple of stitches less each time to take it right up to the point and so I've stopped there because I'm just going to make a loop for my button on my toggle and so the, or the way I'm going to do that is just how you do it in, in crochet, really. You miss joining onto the row below for a couple of stitches. So I've put my two loops back on my thumb. I'm just going to do the two by two. Going to do a couple of stitches without joining. It's just exactly what I was doing when I was making the starting chain. But this time I'm going to join it back on and thereby make a buttonhole and save that one I think that'll do it if I take that off you can see how I've got my little chain going and I'm just going to join it back onto here and that'll finish the finish the top of my little uh, flap so I think I think that's actually fine what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just use my needle and I'm going to blanket stitch down this side so I can get to where I want my shoulder strap to be and so I shall just it's already on my needle I'm going to just do some blanket stitches down down through it all and it'll make a nice edge you can see how there's no patterns for these things you just really have to just practice and it'll be easier than you think to make something up see how the blanket stitch has just made that edge look really nice and i'll be able to do it on that edge when i get to the other side but now what i'm going to do i'm going to get a couple of loops back on my thumb right on this corner so i'm going to go through uh, how shall I do this? I'll go through two and through the one I've just used. So I've got one on my thumb. I'll go through one, through two, through the one on my thumb. And I'm going to use that same stitch again because I don't want my strap to be any further forward, I don't think. I've got all my stitches back again two behind and two on and now all I'm going to do is I'm going to do a chain in two by two until it's long enough to go around my neck I finished my strap I just made a lovely squarish really strong strap that'll go around my neck and I just attached it at the other side with more null bending stitches there's my lovely buttonhole and I've got a few buttons out that I'm auditioning for going on I've got this great big one which is quite nice but it's a proper blue I'm not sure about I've got this these ones which are a bit little but I made them myself out of a branch of wood and I made them for a dress that I made last year and these are the two, the two spare ones that I have left I also have this really nice spider one and I think that's really nice and that could go on there I haven't actually decided what I have decided is I'd like a bit of embroidery on here so I'm going to do that next I feel as if I just want to do a bit of simple wool embroidery so I'm going to do some I've got just a green embroidery wool 
I'm just going to chain stitch a nice little wreath that's going to go around my bag with any luck I put some flowers on this as well as long as I can get it so that my I should put a pin in the bottom of where I want it to be but I'll just I'll just eyeball it to there so as long as I head to there I'll be all right I'm just doing a simple chain stitch with my wool I've got my little trailing vine on just done with um, chain stitch and a few straight stitches for the little leafy bits and I'm just going to pop a very simple flower and you don't even have to go through to the back of the null binding because it's so thick and the main thing will be not to pull the wool too tight and I don't know that I need this colour anywhere else. I hope you do feel inspired to have a go at null binding I hope I haven't made it look too difficult because it isn't really any more difficult than learning knitting or crochet when you don't know them and you've never seen them before they would feel difficult to learn and I don't think this is any any more difficult than them and it's definitely slow when you first start but so is knitting and crochet or sewing or anything that you haven't learned before it takes time to practice and get your muscle memory going but once you have it doesn't really take a huge long of time anyway I tried my best to show all you righties how to do it even though I must have looked a bit awkward because I'm a lefty I'm hoping that all the lefties out there I think they can have a go and I think the last thing I'll put in are some French knots okay, well, I don't want to go through to the back with these French knots so I'm just going to do them from the front and not go right the way through the fabric a bit of that off and say that it's going to go there I think I can say my new and pouch is done and it's really, oh I've got to try my things in so put my phone in put my wallet in Perfect. Close my spider button. Very pleased indeed. Well, I do hope you enjoyed that. And I, I do hope that you have a try at uh, doing it yourself. The video channel that I linked you to, Nilla Kintat, is where I learned all the stitches that I know how to do. Um, but this lovely one in the finished two by two, it, it's a really tight woven stitch. And although it does seem slow when you start, it really is just because you're learning a total new craft. And just think back to when you maybe were just learning knitting or just learning crochet. And it was similarly slow. And it's a heritage craft that was dying out and it's come back again and more and more people are learning how to do it and it is a totally different fabric that you make so thank you for watching and i hope you enjoyed it and thank you to all the new subscribers um, uh, and every just everybody everybody who keeps tuning in to watch me getting on with all sorts of stuff and um, I'm just really grateful that you're here and that you're enjoying what I'm doing. So in the run up to Christmas, there are, there are going to be some bits of different things. I've got some, I've already got some cooking uh, ready to go and some pickle and there'll be sewing and I've got some Christmas presents that I think I can sort of show you. Uh, but the other news is that the yellow quilt that I started when I was filming the Kawandi tutorial, that's now finished. So I haven't got to say anything in case the person realises it's for them. Um, so that's, I'll be, I'll be secretly trying to film some little Christmas present tutorials without giving the game away. 
all in all i'd just like to say thank you for watching and i hope you've pressed the like button and subscribed if you've really liked uh, what i've what i've been doing and i will see you again on sunday with another bird page and unless i change my mind i think i know what i'm doing Unless I, change, unless I change my mind. I've only got a limited amount of birds that I can really put in my bird book now because I've almost exhausted the birds that I see in my garden. Anyway, bye from Marion's world and I'll catch you next time. Thanks a lot everyone. You're all stars.